Hello everyone. I have a hypothetical question for you today. Would you rather have a million dollars now or a penny double each day for the next 30 days and then you get to keep the total at the end? So think about that. Which one would you rather have? So to answer this question, let's explore the data. All right, we're gonna run a quick spreadsheet simulation to see the effect of doubling a penny for 30 days. So on day one, I earn one cent. This means I have one penny total in my pocket. On day two, my penny is doubled, and I can model this using multiplication. So I now have two more cents added in for a total of three cents. On day three, my two cents from day two are doubled, so I earn four more cents. On day three, 10% of the way through my 30 days of earning, I have a grand total of seven cents. Let's continue this pattern down to day 10. On day 10, I add $5.12 to my total, bringing it to just over $10. So I'm officially one third of the way through my 30 days of earning and I only have $10.23 in my pocket. That million dollars may be starting to look pretty good to you right now, but let's keep doubling and see what happens. By day 15, I can now add $163.84. This brings my total to $327.67. Halfway through my 30 days, I have just over $300. A far cry from a million, right? All right, continuing down to day 20. I'm really gonna start to see these numbers add up though. On day 20 alone, I've earned over $5,000 to add to my total, which by the way, has now crossed the $10,000 mark. You can see here that as the number in the earned daily column increases, the doubling pattern has a much greater effect. Here's day 21, 22, 23. On day 24, you'll notice that my total earned is now more than $100,000. Day 25, day 26, day 26, hey, check this out. My total earnings are now over half a million dollars. And on day 27, this is the day we've all been waiting for, 1,342,177.27. There it is, folks. Choosing a penny doubled will earn you more than $1 million. So let's continue down to day 30 just to see how much money I'll end up walking away with. Wow, $10,737,418.23. So not only is a penny doubled the better choice, it is by far the better choice, over 10 times so. The phenomenon that you just experienced is called exponential growth. An exponent simply refers to repeated multiplication. In the case of the penny, we're repeatedly multiplying by the number two. Here, we can see a graphical representation of the data from the spreadsheet. Much like we just discussed, during the first 20 days, there doesn't appear to be much growth. However, starting around day 24 and 25, the numbers explode. We see rapid increase. This is the nature of any exponential growth function. So when I posed the penny double question to my students on our Google Classroom page, one of them summed up the concept perfectly. I pulled out my calculator and dang, that number is big. Yes, yes it is. So why is exponential growth and the exponential growth function so important for us to understand right now? The R0 value is the reproduction number of a virus and indicates how contagious it is. Let's look at a couple of viruses that we're familiar with. The flu has an R0 value of 1.4 to 1.6. This means that one person infected with the flu will most likely spread it to between 1.4 and 1.6 additional people. Measles, on the other hand, is considered highly contagious, as indicated by an R0 value between 12 and 18. Again, this means that one person with the measles will theoretically infect an additional 12 to 18 people. COVID-19 is still a relatively new virus, and we're learning more about it every day. Right now, researchers estimate an R0 value somewhere between 1.4 and 3.9. Hopefully, as time goes on, we'll have a clearer picture of what the true R0 value is. For now, however, we're going to go with the R0 value published in the article Serial Interval of COVID-19 Among Publicly Reported Cases. Researchers here estimate that the reproduction number of COVID-19 is 1.32, with a confidence interval of 95% between 1.16 and 1.48. Let me pause here for a second to explain what a confidence interval means. In statistics, researchers are almost always studying a sample or a subset of a population. To study an entire population is often time-consuming, tedious, and frankly, unrealistic. 
So let's think about your school as the population. A sample then could be 100 students selected to complete a survey about the quality of student life on campus. Results of this survey are then projected to the entire population. Conclusions are drawn and decisions are made. Of the people studied in the article shown here, aka the sample, the mean or average reproduction number of COVID-19 was 1.32. A confidence interval of 95% then indicates that researchers can conclude with 95% certainty that the true population mean reproduction number lies somewhere between 1.16 and 1.48. So in other words, researchers are pretty darn confident that the true R0 value of COVID-19 is somewhere between 1.16 and 1.48. So why did I choose this article and this particular R0 value? First, an R0 value of 1.32 represents a true best case scenario. From the table, Different studies have indicated that COVID-19 has a reproduction number somewhere between 1.4 and 3.9, meaning that each person who contracts the disease spreads it to between 1.4 and 3.9 other people. So let's go with the low end. Second, if you guys know anything about me, I'm all about fact checking and obtaining data from reliable sources. So what makes the data in this article considered reliable? Well, there are a couple reasons. One, the article is published by a reputable source, the Centers for Disease Control, or CDC, and it's not just something I googled on the internet or a meme that I found on social media. At the end of the day, the data is also recent. It was released on March 19th, 2020. Next, the researchers here report some degree of uncertainty in the results, as indicated by the confidence interval. This means they're not claiming to have the exact reproduction number, but are instead providing a reasonable research-based estimate. This is important. Finally, the data for this article will be readily available to the public through GitHub once the article is officially published, and that's currently scheduled for June of 2020. So what this means is that if you're so inclined, you could, in June, go access the raw data to research the conclusions that were presented here. You could run the numbers for yourself. In a sense, you can fact check the researchers and everything that they concluded in this paper. So now that we've settled on an r naught value for COVID-19, we are once again going to explore the data. All right, let's run another spreadsheet simulation, this time to explore the effects of the r naught value of COVID-19. So I'll start with one infected person, just one. Based on our research, we know that this person is likely to spread the disease to approximately 1.32 other people. So we can model this with multiplication. One case times an r naught value of 1.32 gives us one additional case. So notice here that I have my spreadsheet set up rounded to the nearest person. This is because people is a discrete value, meaning that we don't count people using decimals or fractions in real life. The r naught value of 1.32 really means that each person who contracts COVID-19 will spread it to somewhere between one to two others on average. So for the sake of our simulation, we're gonna stick to whole numbers. All right, so we now have a total number of two cases. The individual who has newly contracted COVID-19 at iteration two now spreads the disease to an additional 1.32 people. And we see that there are two new cases that pop up. Remember, the spreadsheet is rounding to the nearest whole person. This brings our total infected to four. Each of these two new cases spreads COVID-19 to an additional 1.32 people. So we end up with two new cases again for a total of six people infected. Let's continue this pattern down to the 10th iteration. By the time we reach the 10th iteration, we're seeing 12 new cases pop up which gives our total number of people infected with COVID-19 to 47. So still not that many, right? Let's continue down some more. So at the 15th iteration here, I'm seeing that there are 49 new cases for a total of nearly 200 people. And by the 20th iteration, we now see that there are 195 new cases with just over 800 people infected. Just like the penny, we're going to see the exponential growth really take off here as the number of cases of COVID-19 increase drastically over the next 10 iterations. By the 25th iteration, we now have 783 new cases for a total of over 3,000 people infected. And finally, by the 30th iteration, there are 3,138 new cases and nearly 13,000 people who've been infected. So all of this is stemming from just one original case. Again, we can see the effects of exponential growth in the data display. Although the number of new cases of COVID-19 starts slow in the beginning, 
exponential growth begins to take effect around iteration 20. The good news here, though, is that the majority of people who contract COVID-19 do recover. So please understand that the data presented here does not necessarily reflect the total number of active cases of the disease, just the number of people who, over time, have contracted COVID-19 at all. By now, I'm sure you've heard of the terms social distancing and flatten the curve. Both of these really boil down to one thing. Reduce the reproduction number of COVID-19 by staying home or away from others as much as possible. This then will inherently flatten the curve, as the concept here is relatively simple. Less people infected, less people to infect others. Oh yeah, real quick, one more thing y'all, wash your hands. Thanks so much you guys, I hope you've enjoyed this video.